It was on a Thursday early in the month when the snow had just begun. The Dave came downstairs for breakfast one morning and he said, you know where my blue sweater is? Mor Morley hates questions like that. <laughs> she had a dim memory of folding sweaters and sealing them in a cardboard box, but she had no memory of what she had done with that box. And this was dangerous territory if she said anything that implied the sweater might have passed through her hands while April passed through May. Morley would be opening herself up to all sorts of liabilities. If she couldn't produce the sweater, she was liable to be labeled a sweater thief. <laughs> if, on the other hand, she was to deny all responsibility, she'd be denying her image of herself as a wife and a homemaker and a mother. In her heart, Morley wanted to be able to produce the blue sweater. She expected it of herself. That's what wives do. They pull blue sweaters out of cardboard boxes. <laughs> Just the way fly fishermen pull trout out of mountain streams. <laughs> when it came to finding lost clothes, however, Morley was more a trawler than a trouter. She stood in the kitchen holding a box of cereal and a plastic bag of milk and imagined the impending search, saw herself moving through the house like one of those draggers that scour the ocean floor for scallops, as likely as not leaving just as much carnage behind her. Don't ask me about sweaters at breakfast, she snapped. It was the only thing she could think of saying. <laughs> that night after supper, Morley headed into the basement with a cup of coffee and a heavy heart. She started down there instead of up in the attic because the basement fit her mood. It was dark and damp and as far from God as she could get without leaving the house. <laughs> as she opened the basement door and stared into the gloom, Morley had a dim notion that this was right, a feeling that maybe she was heading in the right direction. When she got there, she put her coffee on the washing machine and she stared at the pile of boxes along the basement wall. The boxes piled on top of each other. That one, she thought, shrugging. The box was sealed with masking tape. She pulled the tape loose and it caught in her fingers and she rolled it into a ball and the ball stuck to her pants. And she shook the ball loose and it stuck to her slipper and she stepped on it with the other foot and it stuck there. And she said a word that women don't normally say on CBC Radio. <laughs> and then she kicked it free and bent down and opened the carton. Baby clothes. <laughs> How had the box of baby clothes got to the top of the pile? It wasn't a good sign. The boxes were out of sequence. The next box she opened was full of old magazines. The one after that was a box of pants she hadn't worn in years. She was about to close the pant box when something caught her eye. There was something stuck down the side of the box. She reached in and pulled out a package, a package about the size of an apple, wrapped in green and red paper with a little card that said, Merry Christmas, Sam. Love, Margaret. Morley had no idea what it might be. She sat down on a pile of boxes and she reached for her coffee. She took a sip and then she opened the present. It was a palm-sized disc with a video screen, a miniature electronic game. It was the Tamagotchi Dave's mother Margaret had sent from Cape Breton two Christmases ago. <laughs> Morley remembered now, remembered the frustrating hours she had spent that Christmas day searching for the Tamagotchi when it didn't turn up under the tree. She hadn't wanted to give it to Sam, but she hadn't deliberately misplaced it. Funny, she thought, what the mind does. Margaret had sent the Tamagotchi early that December. I had to lie to get it, she said proudly on the telephone. It's the last Tamagotchi in Cape Breton. Now, you might remember what a, what a big deal Tamagotchis were that Christmas, such a big deal that they were hard to come by. Margaret had phoned all over Cape Breton looking for one of these things, and when she found a department store with one left, she had convinced the clerk to put it aside, to hold it for her. Now, they didn't normally do that, said the clerk, but in a moment of inspired improvisation, Margaret had appealed to the clerk's goodwill. She had told him that her grandson was very, very sick, <laughs> critically sick, and he had agreed to put the last Tamagotchi away for her. 
Now, Morley didn't feel comfortable with that kind of lie. And when it arrived in Margaret's Christmas package in early December, Morley worried that the Tamagotchi might be jinxed. It would be tempting fate, she thought, to give Sam something that had been bought like that. God might have been watching Margaret. And if he was a god of retribution, Sam could be struck down with some horrible biblical disease. (laughs) Morley imagined pathogens sweeping along the Trans-Canada Highway towards her house, (laughs) probably in a load of Cape Breton lobsters. (laughs) She agonized about this for days. How much easier, she thought one afternoon, if she'd been born Catholic instead of Presbyterian. (laughs) If she'd been born Catholic, she could have gone to confession preferably in a church where they didn't know her. (laughs) And she could have asked the priest where on the scale of mortal sins lying to store clerks ranked. But Morley wasn't Catholic, and she couldn't talk to a priest. All she could do was talk to herself, and knowing in her heart that this awful little computer chip was a death sentence, Morley had hidden it in the box of pants and without intending to had forgotten where she'd put it. She sat on her pile of boxes in the basement and she stared at the little toy and then then she did something that she suspected the priest would have told her was wrong. She ripped the plastic bubble off the cardboard backing and let the game fall into her hand. The screen was blank. There were two buttons underneath it. She pressed one, nothing happened, and then she pressed the other. Still nothing happened. She picked up the cardboard packaging that she had dropped onto the floor. There were no instructions written on it, not even in Taiwanese. (laughs) She looked at the toy again, and she pressed both buttons, and, and two things happened simultaneously. A little egg bounced abruptly onto the Tamagotchi screen, and Dave appeared. When Morley saw her husband walking across the basement, she slipped the Tamagotchi into her pocket. Maybe if she had already found the blue sweater, she would have shared this discovery with him, but she hadn't, and he didn't need to know about it, or not now anyway. He didn't need to know that she was the one who had lost the present that his mother had sent Sam two Christmases ago. If she could lose track of a toy, she could, by definition, lose track of a sweater. So she slipped the Tamagotchi into her pocket and she looked around for cover, for something that might explain what she was doing sitting on a cardboard box in her basement. The only thing around was the box of magazines she had opened. So she picked a magazine out of the box, which happened to be a People magazine, and which happened to have a picture of the actor Harrison Ford on the cover. It was a casual photograph. Ford was sitting on a porch outside. Maybe it was at his home. He was wearing jeans and a black t-shirt and nothing on his feet. His feet were the closest thing to the camera. Morley was staring at the picture of Harrison Ford when Dave sat down beside her. Look look at his toes, she said, handing him the magazine. (laughs) Dave looked at the picture earnestly. They're they're perfect, said Morley. I think he has pedicures. She wasn't thinking straight. She was upset about the sweater, she was preoccupied with a Tamagotchi, or she wouldn't have said it about his toes being perfect. Knowing that just as there are things that men can say among themselves in locker rooms, things that are all right to say when the only thing they're wearing is a jock strap, and the only people listening are other men, so too there are things that can be said among women which should not, in the interest of long and happy marriages, be said at home. She took the magazine away and threw it back in the box. Come on, she said, let's go upstairs. It was an hour later when they were watching the news that Dave, without taking his eyes off the television, said, you're attracted to Harrison Ford's toes? (laughs) Morley sighed, that's not what I meant, she said. I said, I think he has pedicures. You said they were perfect toes, said Dave. They are perfect toes, said Morley. That's the point. I don't know men who have pedicures. If you're not attracted to Harrison Ford's toes, then why are we talking about them, said Dave. (laughs) Because, said Morley, and she was being very careful here, she was not going to have a fight about Harrison Ford's toes. (laughs) But because, said Morley, I've never heard of a man who has pedicures. 
And then she said, I, I think I'd leave you if you started to have pedicures. Dave frowned. Well, said Morley, I'd be awfully suspicious. Later, when she was getting undressed for bed, Morley remembered the Tamagotchi in her pocket, and she took it out and she slipped it into her purse. She had disposed of it the next day at work. They lay in bed that night beside each other, but not together. The lights were off, and the two of them were lying on their backs, both of them staring at the ceiling, both of them absorbed in their own thoughts. And then just as Morley was slipping away, Dave propped himself up on an elbow and looked down on her and said, Remember? Remember when I killed the snake last summer? Morley, Morley grunted softly and turned toward her husband. At the cottage, he said, when I killed that snake. Morley nodded, and Dave said, Harrison Ford is afraid of snakes, you know. <laughs> Uh, Morley raised her head. What, she said? <laughs> Dave said, it's like a phobia. He'd, he'd be chewing on his toes if there was a snake in that picture on the cover of People magazine. <laughs> Morley dropped her head down on the pillow. Dave, she said, that's Indiana Jones who's afraid of snakes. <laughs> she forgot about the Tamagotchi until the next day at lunchtime. She was standing in line in a cafeteria waiting to pay for her lunch. And she reached into her purse looking for her wallet and she pulled out the Tamagotchi instead. The egg that she had produced by pushing the two buttons in the basement was rocking back and forth on the screen. And as she watched it, it started to rock faster and faster and then right before her eyes, right there in the cafeteria line, it hatched. <laughs> Suddenly, instead of the lifeless egg, there was a little creature pacing back and forth across the screen. Morley was amazed by what had happened. She stood in front of the cash register, staring at the screen in her hand. The egg had hatched into a little animated chicken. <laughs> the man in the line behind her said, excuse me, and pushed by her. And the little chicken looked out at Morley and chirped. <laughs> and the most unexpected thing happened. Morley was hit by a wave of maternal instinct. <laughs> She was 46 years old, her youngest child was seven, and she had just given birth <laughs> in a cafeteria. Before she had a bite of her sandwich, chicken salad, <laughs> she spent 15 minutes sitting at her table in the cafeteria playing with her baby. It took her five minutes of trial and error to figure out which buttons to press to feed it, and then a few more minutes to figure out how to clean its cage. And when, she, and when she finally put the Tamagotchi down, she felt simultaneously proud and ashamed of herself. She stuffed it back in her purse, ate her sandwich, and went back to work. Twice that afternoon, she pulled it out and fed it. <laughs> Caring for it at home was more complicated. Excuse me, she said when it began to chirp while she was washing the dishes. She went to the bathroom and locked the door and pulled the toy out of her pocket and pressed the buttons. She knew this was ridiculous, but she wasn't about to let a chicken starve to death in her house. Twenty minutes later, while she was straightening out the pile of shoes by the front door, the Tamagotchi chirped again. She frowned as she headed back to the bathroom. Are, are you okay, said Dave, <laughs> who was walking out as she was walking in. Morley put the Tamagotchi in her t-shirt drawer when she got to bed, and when it started to chirp, Dave looked up, puzzled. <laughs> Morley said, it's a stopwatch I brought from work, and she, she hopped over to the dresser, and she picked up her Tamagotchi and took it to the bathroom and looked at the chicken and said, you can't be serious, I just fed you. <laughs> Dave was too preoccupied to notice what was going on. As soon as Morley ran to the bathroom, Dave had lifted the sheets and stared at his feet.
He was still wearing his socks. He glanced towards the bathroom and then he reached down and he pulled one of the socks off and his toenails glistened under the covers. They looked beautiful. As good as Harrison Ford's toes. Better. Because Dave had had a pedicure that afternoon. When he heard the toilet flush, he pulled his sock back on and he rolled over. It wasn't that he was threatened by Harrison Ford's toes. He knew Morley wasn't going to leave him because some movie star had prettier feet than he did. He was more curious than anything. It had never occurred to him that a man could have his nails done. It seemed like a waste of money to pay someone to cut your nails. If God had wanted me to have pedicures, thought Dave, why would he have given me teeth? But the more he stared at the picture of Harrison Ford's feet, he had, you see, brought the magazine upstairs and had hidden it under a pile of papers by his bed so he could study it more carefully. And the more he looked at the picture and the more he compared Harrison Ford's feet to his feet, he had to admit that even when it came to toes, Harrison Ford was Hollywood and he was Hamilton. And when he woke up the next morning and was standing in the bathroom brushing his teeth and he looked down at his ugly feet, he knew then and there, just as Betty Friedan had cleared the way for women to walk proudly out of their kitchens and into the workplace, Harrison Ford had just made it possible for him to have a pedicure. He just had to make sure it wasn't at some neighborhood place where he might be recognized. <laughs> When Dave got to work, he hauled out the yellow pages. The woman at the first place said, I don't know if we do, men. No one's ever asked. <laughs> there was no confusion at the second store. We do men's hands, but not their feet, said the receptionist. And then she added mysteriously, we don't wax men either. <laughs> I don't understand it either. <laughs> Now, Morley had always said that having her feet done was the best. Once when she had said that, David said, better than a massage. And Morley had said, way better, better than anything. Because he didn't tell Morley that he went for a pedicure, Dave was not able to ask her how allowing someone to work on the soles of your feet with power tools <laughs> could possibly be thought of in the same context as massage. The very idea that his wife could enjoy this cast her in a new and worrying light. <laughs> if this, thought Dave, what else? But he didn't tell her about the pedicure, couldn't tell her. Not because his feet looked bad, but because they looked so damn good. <laughs> they were the best looking part of him. Dave didn't know they'd put nail polish on his toes. <laughs> His toes looked like they'd been verithaned and startlingly different than any other part of his body. So Dave was wearing socks in bed. And when he wanted to check his feet, which was something he felt compelled to do often because they looked so damn good, he'd go into the bathroom and lock the door and take his socks off and stare at them. Once he took the People magazine in there and put it on the floor. <laughs> and put his feet beside Harrison Ford's. And he thought he didn't come out so bad. Maybe not Hollywood, but not Hamilton either. And all the time Dave was doing this, sneaking in and out of the bathroom with a nail file to do maintenance or to have a quick peek. Morley was sneaking in and out of the same room to feed the Tamagotchi. And this was going on for a week. Both of them too preoccupied with their own secret to notice the others. Only Stephanie, who needed the bathroom more than either of them, seemed to be bothered by it. What is going on, she said one night, while Morley scooted in as Dave slipped out. 
The first time Morley answered that question, it was to a woman she'd never met. It was on a Friday night, and she was grocery shopping, and she was feeding the Tamagotchi as she moved down the cereal aisle. So she had her head down and wasn't paying attention, and she knocked into the woman coming the other way, and they smiled at each other. And Morley ruefully held up the Tamagotchi, and she said, it's my son's alien chicken. Let's see, said the woman. As Morley held the toy out in the palm of her hand, the chicken started to chirp. Don't worry, said the woman, it requires less attention when it grows up. It was a true moment of motherhood. (laughs) It was the next evening that Stephanie came downstairs wearing Dave's blue sweater. Morley stared at her. Where did you get that, she demanded. It was in my drawer, said Stephanie, defensively. That night as they lay in bed, Morley reached out for Dave and said, Do you remember last Christmas when I couldn't find the present your mother sent Sam? And she got out of bed and opened her t-shirt drawer and she picked out the Tamagotchi and she handed it to Dave. She showed him how she fed it and how she cleaned it and how she played with it. And then as they sat there in their bed, the toy started to beep. What else does it do, asked Dave, handing it back. It beeps, said Morley, pushing the buttons expertly, and then it dies. She fiddled with the buttons for a few moments and then carried it back to the bureau, and she came back to bed and she snuggled up to Dave, and the Tamagotchi started beeping from the drawer, and Morley said, I gotta go and get it. I'm I'm not gonna be able to sleep if I think that thing's gonna die tonight. And she flipped on the light and she started to get out of bed and Dave held out his arm and said, I'll get it. And he got it and he held it out and he smiled and he said, what sort of trauma, he asked, what what sort of trauma do you think it would be for a mother to find out that their husband had murdered her baby? And Morley said, no, don't don't do that. Even Harrison Ford wouldn't do that, (laughs) even in a movie. And Dave said, what? Morley was looking at his feet. smiling. The Tamagotchi lasted almost two more weeks. When it died, Morley took it outside and buried it in the backyard beside the guinea pig. Thank you very much.